Hello， 德军。Hi。Welcome。Hi。You can share screen if you want. Let's wait a bit because people may start to join. Okay, let me share screen. So this will stop you sharing screen. You can directly share. Yes. Great. What What do you see? Do you see the slide? Yes, I saw the okay. hands in the bottom. Mm -hmm. Are you ready to start? I can introduce you. Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome to Harvard CMSA Quantum Matter uh, Seminar. Um, it is our great honor today to have uh, uh, Liu Junzhou from uh, Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. And uh, uh, Liu Jun studied at uh, uh, Harvard and MIT when he was a grad student uh, on the center and also uh, closely uh, with uh, Subir. And uh, then he went to Perimeter Institute for postdoc. And uh, today he will be continuing his uh, talk uh, from this, uh, the, the, the first part is uh, the Bonjan told us uh, last week about the decombined metallic uh, quantum criticality. So this will be uh, based on the work he said. All right, so let's work on your screen. Uh, you you? Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, yeah, it's a good pleasure to give this second talk on this talk on decombined metallic quantum criticality. So the talk will be based on these two papers and the uh, and uh, these are done in collaboration with the engine. Let, let me start by uh, showing you this photo. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be at least virtually back to Boston. I miss Boston a lot, and uh, I'd like to share with you this photo I took a couple of years ago, which I think combines a lot of uh, important, uh, important ingredients of Boston. For example, this is MIT Dome, and this bridge, although it's close to MIT, but it's called Hubble Bridge, and there's Charles River and Boston people. Uh, just as Henry said, if you are lucky enough to have lived in Boston as a young man, then wherever you go for the rest of your life, it stays with you, for Boston is a movable feast. Okay, uh, without further ado, let's go into the talk. Uh, I will first give a brief, uh, a broad introduction and then go to the details. So let me first talk about what I talk about when I talk about quantum matter. There are many types of quantum matters and they can be kept described by uh, many, many properties. For example, they can be described by their chemical compounds, their density, their strength, or maybe their colors and flavors. So if we want to capture all these properties, we may be easily lost. So a more efficient way may be to find some common properties shared by a class of quantum matters. And uh, we refer to these common properties as the universal properties of this entire class. And this class is often referred to as the uh, universality class of quantum matters. Uh, these universal properties often show up at known distance and low energies, just like these two samples the left sample has a very detailed description of the system. And if you go to the known distance limit, just look at the 
essential features, uh, it becomes more abstract, but you see it captures all the essential features. Um, more, as a more nerdy example, we can look at this model described by a couple of parameters. And there are, in this parameter space, there are a couple of faces uh, like this MI, meaning a molten slater, and SF, meaning a superfluid. There's also the phase boundaries separating the two phases. Uh, if we want to just, if we want to ignore the microscopic details and just look at the universal properties, we can picture the lambda figure as the parameter space uh, with some with some RG fixed points. So here, the the two blue stars represent the two RG fixed points corresponding to molten slate and superfluid. Uh, in between, there's this uh, quantum critical point separating them. So uh, from such examples, we can summarize a Picasso is worldview. That is, uh, we we view all the possible theories of quantum matters in the parameter space, and they can the universal properties can be captured by some of by some RG fixed points. Some of the RG fixed points are stable against the perturbation, so they correspond to quantum phases, and some of them will flow to some some of them are unstable and they will flow to some stable ones once they are perturbed. Uh, these, are, these are the transitions. Is there a question? Oh, uh, okay. And then there are some arrows. Uh, these arrows are often referred to as mechanisms to go from one phase to the other or uh, draft the phase transition. For example, if we have a superconductor coming out from a metal, then we can, the, some of the mechanisms can be electron phonon mediated pairing or electron spin wave, spin wave mediated pairing or some skirmian condensation or some RVB mechanisms. So uh, what I want to say here is to understand the universal physics of quantum matter is very useful to just look at the uh, fixed points and the flows between them. So let's look at what we know about quantum phases. Look at what we know about the quantum phases. Uh, this is a is our understanding as of today. It may be completely different tomorrow. And uh, you may notice that I have used this same slide for many times. Uh, it maybe for more than a year. And uh, so this picture has not been changed. I don't know if it's fortunate or unfortunate. Uh, so roughly speaking, we have two types of quantum matters, either gapped ones or gapless ones. So within the gapped ones, we also have short energy entangled ones and the non energy entangled ones. Within the short energy entangled ones, uh, we, also, we can also have two types. One is called trivial trivial states. Uh, they are like the product states. And the other is um, symmetry protected trivial or symmetry protected topological states, like the topological insulator. There are also non energy entangled phases like topological orders and the more exotic fractal net phases. We have a lot of progress in understanding gapped matters, but the understanding of gapless matters is relatively limited so far. So I can let me just roughly classify them in terms of what protects the gaplessness of the gapless matter. So far, we know there are three mechanisms. Um, the first one is the gaplessness is protected by simultaneously breaking of some continuous symmetry. Then due to the Goldstone theorem, there will be gapless Goldstone mode. The second mechanism is not protected by, uh, by broken symmetry, but by symmetries that are preserved. For example, in a Fermi liquid, if we have U1 symmetry, U1 charge conservation symmetry, and translation symmetry, then this state is a stable gapless matter. But for example, the U1 symmetry is either spontaneously or explicitly broken, the system can be gapped. Uh, the other class, the gap, in the other class, the gaplessness is not related to the symmetry. So I call them gapless phases protected by their entanglement pattern. And the typical example is a three plus one D U1 quantum spin liquid. So we have many interesting quantum phases of matter, and some of them may even be very useful, at least theoretically. For example, 
and some of the phases here are, are proposed to be useful to do topological quantum computation. So uh, we have so many interesting quantum phases, and in fact, they occupy most of the regions of the phase diagram. Uh, so why do we care about quantum phase transitions? After all, they only occupy at most of the major zero subset of phase boundaries on the phase diagram. Uh, I want to say we care about quantum phase transitions uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, if the phase transition is continuous, then it may be described by some interesting universality class, which is interesting on its own. Second, in order to understand the transition between two phases, it requires us to understand the intricate interplay among all moving parts of the systems, meaning the, uh, all the low energy excitations of the system. So having such an understanding of phase transitions provides us with a unified understanding of not only the transition itself, but the nearby regions. So uh, this is my manifesto to, to declare why studying quantum phase transitions is important and interesting. Now let's look at some examples of quantum phase transitions. Uh, I, want to, I want to divide them into two classes, either transitions in insulators or in metals. So for transitions in insulators, this topic, both topics have been studied in, for many years and uh, is, uh, the transitions in insulators are better understood. The most common, common paradigm is this Nando ginzburg wilson paradigm where we have a phase transition between two phases where one of them preserves certain symmetry but the other spontaneously breaks the symmetry. Uh, there can be more exotic type uh, like the classic deconfined quantum criticality where the two phases are still conventional symmetry broken phases, but the symmetries they break are, are seemingly unrelated. So from the standard Nando ginzburg wilson paradigm, such a transition seems to be discontinuous, but in principle, it can be continuous. And uh, this is for transitions in, my, in insulators. Now let's look at the transitions in metals. The, uh, a big difference between these two classes of transitions is in metals, you see, this is our momentum space and energy. In metals, we have a Fermi C of electrons and the, the near, and there's, there's this Fermi level and near the Fermi level, we have this Fermi surface around which there are abundant gapless degrees of freedom because of uh, this abundant gapless degrees of freedom, the low energy dynamics is more complicated and usually more challenging to study. A typical, a typical type of uh, metallic quantum criticality is this metal insulated transitions. And uh, maybe the simplest example of a metal insulated transition is a Lipschitz transition, which is achieved by depleting the electrons in this Fermi C is like we drink the wine and then we shrink the Fermi surface until it disappears and the system turns into an insulator. So in this case, right before the system becomes an insulator, the, the, the system doesn't really have a Fermi surface of electrons. The, or you can say the size of the Fermi surface is infinitesimal. The other type of transition I would like to call centers transition uh, is uh, so what's happening in this transition is uh, the, the electronic Fermi surface is also gone after the transition, but it, it, it turns into a neutral Fermi surface of some emergent excitations. And so this is a type of multi transition. Uh, and uh, so here by multi transition, I just mean an interruption driven metal insulator transition. Uh, because this center of transition will play some the spirit of the center of the transition will play some role in the later part. Let me review it in more details. This is a cartoon picture of center of the transition. Uh, so here we have one phase that is a Fermi liquid and another phase that is an insulator. This solid circle represents the Fermi surface of the electrons in the Fermi liquid. And uh, the dashed circle represents a uh, Fermi surface of some neutral, emergent neutral excitations. They are separated by the transition here. To describe such a transition, 
we can think of the following pattern construction where the electronic annihilation operator is written as a product of uh, the bosonic operator B times the fermionic, fermionic operator F. You can see from this expression, there's a U1 digit redundancy. Namely, if we rotate B and F by such phase factors, this expression is invariant. What this implies is at low energies, the system will be described by these two patterns coupled to an emergent U1 gauge field, which I call A. So in, in the schematic equation, it can be written in this way, where C is the original electron operator, and this capital A corresponds to the crop gauge field corresponding to the U1 charge conservation. So after this pattern construction, the effective theory of the system looks like this, is a, is a, is described by this fermionic pattern coupled to the emergent U1 gauge field, as well as the bosonic pattern coupled to uh, both the crop gauge field and the, the emergent gauge field. So here I now the boson to carry the charge, the global charge. Now to describe these phases and the phase transitions, what I need to do is to, is to specify what states B and F I want to put into. For F, I will give it a generic Fermi surface. By generic, I mean it doesn't have properties like nesting and so on. And for B, for the theory of B here, I will tune it so that it can either be condensed or gapped. If it's condensed, then due to Higgs mechanism, A, the gauge field A will be gapped out. And uh, also when B, develop, when B is condensed, then namely B develops a non-zero expectation value. Uh, the, the operator C and F just differ by a number. So their correlation functions also just differ by a number. So the Fermi surface of F now implies a Fermi surface of C. What this tells us is the resulting state in this case is a Fermi liquid of the electron. Now on the other side, if we are in that B, B gap, then at low energies, I, what I will have is a gapless Fermi surface of F that is coupled to the inversion gauge field A. Uh, so this is what we mean by insulator with neutral Fermi surface. It's an insulator because there's a charge gap, which is the gap of B, and it has a Fermi surface of the neutral F excitations. So from this picture, you see the transition of the this transition is driven by the condensation transition of B. I will, uh, I will say more about the dynamics of this theory later. Okay, so having these examples, one may wonder, one may wonder whether, we can, whether we can have more exotic types of uh, mechanical quantum criticality. So here I want to introduce uh, some of them. Uh, one is what we call deconfined metal matter metal insulated transition, and the other is what we call uh, deconfined metal, metal transition. So uh, let's look at this deconfined metal insulated transition. It's a transition from a Fermi liquid to an insulator, but the insulator has no emergent uh, neutral Fermi surface. It has no le leftover Fermi surface of anything. And this is to be compared with, with Centos transition, where we go from a Fermi liquid with an uh, electronic Fermi surface to an insulator that has some leftover neutral Fermi surface. So in this transition, I let it have no remaining Fermi surface of anything. And uh, for this deconfined metal metal transition, uh, we can have uh, two Fermi liquids with different sizes of, uh, of Fermi surfaces. Uh, and this is also to be contrasted with another transition in this paper where we, we start we start with a system with two Fermi surfaces, where one of them undergoes Centos transition and the other remains as a spectator across the transition. So we go from a metal with Fermi liquid metal with two Fermi surfaces to uh, another insulator with either one with one Fermi surface and another neutral, remaining neutral Fermi surface. Okay. I want to mention uh, what requirement I want to have on the other side of the phase. So for this insulator, the only requirement I want to, I want to give it is uh, it has no neutral, remaining neutral Fermi surface and uh, it can either break symmetry or host topological order and so on. And the same is for the metals here. It can break symmetry or host 
topological order and my requirement is not to have any neutral firm surface. Okay, and th that was conceptual motivations. There are also some experimental motivations. In some compounds, there's, there seem to be experimental evidence where an abrupt change of the electronic forming surface is achieved across some seemingly continuous transition. And the other side may or may not have a remaining neutral from the surface. So, okay, with all these motivations, what we want now is, uh, is to have some critical theories for this deconfined mechanical quantum criticality. And now I will go to the, this is for the introduction. Now I will go to the uh, more detailed part of the talk. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, uh, so let's talk about the mechanism of the deconfined mechanical quantum criticality. Uh, so let's first appreciate why this is non-trivial. To appreciate this, let's look at the key questions here. So, uh, we want to ask, how can we remove a generic electronic Fermi surface and get an insulator by a continuous transition? To see what why it's very difficult to answer this question, let's first review some known mechanisms for removing an electronic Fermi surface. The first mechanism is to add disorder. In this case, we may turn the metal into some Anderson, Anderson insulator. And uh, in fact, if we add disorder and break translation symmetry, strictly, strictly speaking, the notion of Fermi surface is no longer sharp to start with. The other way to remove a, a, a electronic firm surface is to remove the electrons. Just like in the Lipschitz transition, we remove the electrons and uh, the system may go into an insulator um, because the firm surface is, is eventually shrunk to zero. But in this case, there's really no firm surface right before the system becomes insulating. So uh, in this, it, it also, doesn't qualify the criteria here, uh, namely uh, we remove the insulator and get, we remove the Fermi surface and get the insulator because right before the system becomes an insulator, there's no Fermi surface. Then the other mechanism is to have some density wave order. Uh, this can work, but it usually only works for some very special Fermi surfaces, like the ones with special nesting properties, not for generic Fermi surfaces. Then the, the fourth mechanism is to have pairing of the electrons. This will usually indeed gap out the entire Fermi surface, but after doing that, what we usually obtain is a superconductor, rather an insulator, uh, but here we want to get an insulator. Then the most, maybe the most recent mechanism is a central mechanism, uh, where we turn an electronic Fermi surface into a neutral ghost Fermi surface but uh, we don't want to use your boost Fermi surface here. So um, by, by our definition of the deconfined mechanical quantum criticality. So if we want to ask what is a valid mechanism for these new transitions, uh, our idea is to combine four and five in some way. Let me mention, uh, here I'm focusing on how to remove the electronic Fermi surface and get an insulator. I'm not uh, talking too much about the other features of the other side of the face, for example, what symmetry is it break, what topological order it has. Uh, the reason I'm not talking about that is because there are, this is relatively better understood and there might be hundreds of thousands of papers on it. So I will not talk too much. And you can also find our papers uh, to talk about them. So now let's see how we can combine pairing and the uh, central mechanism to achieve a uh, deconfined metallic quantum criticality. Uh, to talk about this, we recall in central transition, an important feature is the existence of a gauge field. So let's look at the interplay between uh, pairing and the gauge fluctuations. And uh, to start with, let's ignore any gauge fluctuation and just look at the pairing physics, the usual pairing physics, uh, originally discovered by Cooper many years ago. Uh, there is this well-known Cooper instability, namely if we have a Fermi surface and uh, if we have some attractive interaction, then this, then some infinitesimal 
attract interaction, we already need to pair in, namely a non-zero expectation value of operators of this form, and uh, this can gap out the firm surface. This phenomenon can be formulated in terms of RG, let's denote uh, V to be the four fermion interaction, then the beta function of V is of this form, so minus V squared. So you see, if V is positive, meaning it's repulsive to start with in the UV, then on the RG flow, this V flows to zero. So we still have a Fermi liquid. Uh, but if V starts from some negative value on the RG flow, it flows to negative infinity, this signals some pair instability, and we have a superconductor. Now, let's bring in the effect of gauge fluctuations. First of all, when the fermions are also coupled to a dynamical U1 gauge field, then the paired state is no longer a superconductor, it's an electric insulator, because when it's coupled to a dynamical U1 gauge field, and when they pair, the global U1 symmetry is unbroken. Second, uh, we can, this is a, this, this first point is talking about what happens if they do pair, but now let's see uh, the tendency of pairing when there is gauge fluctuation. Uh, let's look at this picture. So suppose this is our Fermi surface, and uh, we know the pairing usually happens between the antipodal patches on the Fermi surfaces. Notice this patch, near these patches, fermions have opposite Fermi velocities. So, from high school, we know uh, if we have two currents moving in the same direction, then they, they will ex experience some attractive amperial interaction. And if the currents are in the opposite directions, they will experience some repulsive amperial interaction. Now, these two patches have opposite Fermi velocities. So fermions near these two patches have opposite currents and what this tells us is there will be repulsive amperial interaction. Um, so from this physical picture, <coughs> we, know, we know with gauge fluctuations, pairing will be suppressed. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, this kind of RG, uh, what, what will happen is this beta function will be, this original beta function will be replaced by this form. So there's still this minus V squared piece but there's one more piece coming from the coupling to the gauge field, where this alpha is the gauge coupling. And the alpha itself also has a flow, which will be discussed later. Okay, so what we see here is uh, having gauge fluctuation has an advantage, that is the paired state is, uh, is, no, is no longer a superconductor, but an insulator. But it also has a disadvantage, that is we don't want to have if there's gauge field, we don't want to have pairing to start with. So uh, how, how should we overcome this disadvantage? Mm, the answer was kind of hinted by Anderson because he said more is different. So uh, having one you want gauge field is not good for us, let's just have two. Let's consider this picture where we have two Fermi surfaces that are identical, but we have two of them. And each Fermi surface is coupled to a U1 gauge field. So Fermi surface one is coupled to A1, Fermi surface two is coupled to A2. There can also be coupling between A1 and A2, but, uh, but let's assume there's a exchange symmetry between the one and the two indices. Then it's useful to make the combination, symmetric and anti-symmetric combination of A1 and A2 in this form. After this combination, uh, the system looks like we have the Fermi surface one, now it's coupled to AC plus AS, and Fermi surface two coupled to AC minus AS. Now let's analyze what effect the gauge fluctuations have on pairing. For AC, it's still the same. It will immediate repulsive and pure interaction for, patch, for antipodal patches. So it will suppress pairing. But now let's look at AS, and let's consider the patch one and patch four they have opposite Fermi velocities, but they also carry opposite charges on the AS. So for fermions near the patch one and the patch four, their currents are actually in the same direction. Their currents on the AS are actually in the same direction. So AS will mediate attractive amperial interaction for fermions near patch one and four. The same is true for uh, patch two and three. Uh, so what this tells us is 
Although AC still wants to suppress pairing, but AS tends to promote pairing. Then there's this competition between AC and AS, and this competition will determine the stability of the firm surface. And this phenomena uh, of possible pairing due to two U1 gauge fields was first uh, discussed a long time ago, um, but its relevance to these uh, mechanical quantum criticalities uh, had only been recently noticed. For example, in this paper, we, we derived this beta function uh, and there are more recent papers. Uh, so let's summarize here. Uh, the lesson we have learned just now is that if we, uh, if we have a Fermi surface that is coupled to a U1 plus U1 gauge field, then we may induce some pairing instability and the Fermi surface may be removed. And this phenomena, this mechanism can also be formulated for U2 gauge field or other similar non linear gauge field. And this is a reminiscent of the phenomena of color superconductivity in high energy physics. And let me emphasize again, the resulting state is a color superconductor, not an electric superconductor. It's in fact an electric insulator since the global U1 symmetry is preserved. And using this, we can, we can use it as a, as a building block to describe a large class of deconfined mechanical quantum criticality. In fact, based on this, these mechanisms, you can build up a family of infinitely many theories. So now uh, the, our task is to present a concrete example of uh, deconfined mechanical quantum criticality. Any questions for now? Okay, uh, so we now want to describe a concrete example of the deconfined mechanical quantum criticality, uh, and this is a deconfined metal insulated transition in quantum hole by layers. The setup is the following. We have two layers that are the, uh, two quantum hole layers that are, that are separated by a distance d, and uh, they are under some uniform background magnetic field. Uh, I also have a crystal potential for these two layers um, such that there's a one flux quantum threading through each unit cell and I fix the electron density at this density nu uh, which is equal to c divided by c plus one where c is an integer that is not zero or minus one. Uh, here I'm focusing on the case where c is positive. You can also formulate the theory where c is negative but in that case, you will add many absolute values, add many absolute values uh, in the notations. So for just for notation simplicity, let me not describe them, but the physics is very similar. Furthermore, I want to have uh, exchange symmetry between the two layers, and I want to have an in-plane erosion symmetry. Uh, in addition, I want to uh, have I want to assume the electron density density interaction is of this polar form r to the minus one minus epsilon long range, where this epsilon long range is taken to be, be to be larger than one and larger than zero and smaller than one. And you notice the special case where epsilon long range is precisely equal to zero is the quantum interaction, the usual quantum interaction. Uh, finally, let me assume there's a you want charge conservation symmetry for each layer. Uh, let me mention these ingredients are ordered by their importance. Uh, the above ones are more important and the lower ones are less important. For example, this uh, U1 charge conservation can be relaxed, relaxed and uh, this uh, kind of uh, a little bit strange interaction can also, is also not fundamental, it's just for technical convenience. And we can uh, capture this setup in terms of the following model. So we have a kinetic Hamiltonian uh, that describes uh, two layers of uh, electrons moving on the uniform magnetic field and the crystal potential. Uh, so this is the uniform magnetic field and this is the crystal potential. And they have uh, this kind of interaction density density interaction. So if they are in the same plane, then uh, the interaction decays as r to the, decays as one over r to the one plus epsilon long range. 
if they are on ob object planes, they, then the, their dis the distance between two electrons is the three dimensional distance. So there's this R squared plus B squared to this power. And this, this is the known, known, known distance limit in form of the interaction. It can be suitably regularized at small distances. Okay. Uh, so, so now I want to uh, argue that in this system we can have the we can have some interesting quantum phase transitions. And let me just uh, first give a preview. Uh, so let's consider the case where we have a single layer rather than two layers. Then we will see there can be a transition from a Fermi liquid to what we call a generalized composite Fermi liquid, GCFL. Uh, this is for a single layer. Now, suppose we have two layers. What will happen is uh, in the Fermi liquid side, suppose each layer still undergoes the single layer transition. Then in the Fermi liquid side, when we have two layers, that just becomes a bigger Fermi liquid. It turns out if we have two layers of generalized composite Fermi liquid, this bilayer is unstable to form an insulator that has no neutral Fermi surface. Furthermore, the transition, uh, at the transition, it turns out the interlayer couplings can be all irrelevant. So the transition mm, is still stable. And uh, uh, this transition from a Fermi liquid to the insulator can be viewed as two effectively decoupled transitions where each one, which, where each one of the decoupled sector is this uh, Fermi liquid to generalize the composite Fermi liquid transition. Uh, I'd like to mention our work is a combination and the generalization of many previous works. So I think I'm responsible to give them appropriate credits. For example, in this paper, the authors studies, uh, study a transition from a Fermi liquid to a usual composite Fermi liquid. Then we combined some results of this paper studying plateau transitions in the context of uh, fractional chain insulators with this paper we get the transition from Fermi liquid to generalize the composite Fermi liquid. And also here, um, the, the instability uh, to form an insulator of two layers of generalized composite Fermi liquid was uh, reminiscent of uh, the result of this paper, which says if we have two layers of composite Fermi liquids, then the resulting state is unstable to form an insulator. And then the decoupling, the interlayer decoupling between the critical points uh, is a result of these papers. Okay, so to understand it, let's first uh, look at the single layer physics. Again, we do the pattern construction where C is written as BF. And uh, again, there's the, just as Centaur's transition, then there's this um, U1 digit redundancy, which means the theory, effective theory, can be written as the bosonic and the patterns coupled to a dynamic U1 gauge field. As well, and there's also the um, probe U1 gauge field corresponding to the global U1 charge conservation uh, that B carry it. So uh, this the fermion coupled to the dynamic, there's two sectors, the fermions coupled to the dynamic U1 gauge field and the bosonic sector. So this bosonic sector is what, we're, what we will tune to drive the transition. Sorry, um, can you say again, what is the tuning parameter M in the previous slide? Uh, I will say it later. I will introduce it later. Okay, okay. Uh, so now you see this system is kind of complicated. It has many degrees of freedom. For example, the gauge field A, the boson B, and the, the fermion F. So the question is how we can analyze the critical dynamics of this system because it looks very intricate. So what I will use is uh, what I want to refer to as central paradigm for this kind of critical dynamics. Uh, so in, within this paradigm, we, can do, we, we do the following three steps things. First, we divide the system into two sectors, the sector of the boson B and the sector that contains the fermion and the gauge field A. Next, we ignore the company between these two sectors and study them separately. Finally, we examine the coupling between these two sectors. You may wonder what's the advantage of doing this. It turns out the advantage is there's a punchline that is these two sectors, the B sector and the FA sector, 
under certain conditions can be effectively decoupled. Uh, I will say more about this, but this is the overall picture or strategy. So now let's do it, let's do it in this way. We divide the system into the two sectors, the FA sector and the, and the uh, bosonic sector. Let's look at the FA sector first. So this is a problem of family, family surface coupled to an emergent dynamic one gauge field. Uh, this has been studied for a long time and there are a lot of results. Uh, so I want to put everything you need to know on one slide next. But in case you have never seen them before, this slide might be a bit overwhelming. So my plan is I will first walk you through the slide and then I will pause for 30 seconds, about 30 seconds, uh, during which you may more over it and uh, possibly formulate some questions. So let's look at this system of women liquid couple to emerging new engaged field. Uh, so studied by many previous works, uh, it turns out the most important interaction for such a system is between fermions near the antipodal patches on the fermion surface, as well as the gauge field that has a momentum almost uh, perpendicular to the Fermi velocities of these two patches. So that we use this so-called patch formulation and focus on the coupling between the antipodal patches on the Fermi surface, as well as this gauge field. Then the effective theory takes the following form. So we have this first term that describes the kinetic energy as well as the fermions coupled to the gauge field. So this term is, is, uh, so is, expanded, is expanded around the patches here. That's why you see the dispersion is just uh, the dispersion of the fermions, just uh, some Fermi velocity times the distance away from the Fermi surface plus some curvature of the Fermi surface, plus some correction due to the curvature of the Fermi surface. The second term, uh, LA, describes the dynamics of the gauge field itself. So uh, it takes this form. You notice, uh, now I'm writing it in the momentum space. You notice if this, there's this parameter epsilon, if epsilon is equal to one, then this is just our usual Maxwell interaction for the gauge field. But uh, here I will not fix the value of epsilon um, because later you will see sometimes it's zero, sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the epsilon long range we introduced before. Uh, let me not fix it. But later you, uh, you momentarily you will see with the larger epsilon, we will have stronger gauge fluctuations. And then there's also the four fermion interactions. So this system can be, to understand this system, we can study the RG flows of various quantities in this system. For example, the Fermi velocity and the flow of the gauge company and the four fermion interaction. The beta function looks like this. Uh, I will not read it. Uh, you can look at it. So the fixed point and turns out to be such that and the fixed point value of the Fermi velocity is zero. The fixed point value of the gauge coupling is epsilon over two. And the, the fixed point value of the four Fermi interaction is square root of epsilon over two. Uh, so first you see uh, the Fermi velocity flows to zero. This is a signature where we have a system with no quasar particle because um, the, even the velocities of the quasar particles disappear. Uh, secondly, you see the gauge coupling flows to a value proportional to epsilon that's indeed us with a larger epsilon to have stronger gauge fluctuations. And with a stronger gauge fluctuation, we see um, this four-fermion interaction becomes a, a more positive number, so it suppresses pairing more. Uh, okay, this is for the fermion part uh, and this tenuous. Uh, we will have a critical Fermi surface. So we, we will still have the Fermi surface because we still have a, have a, have a fixed point that, is, that corresponds to some RG scanning environment system. So we still have a critical Fermi surface, but there's no quasi particles. Now let's look at the uh, gauge field. Due to the coupling of the gauge field to the abundant gapless degrees freedom near the Fermi surface, the gauge field will, be, will experience what's known as the Nando damping. Uh, more precisely, if we look at the propagator of the gauge field, notice this A here means the, means the spatial component of the gauge field. And in fact, we are in Coulomb gauge, so this is the transverse spatial component. Uh, we, we are not caring about the time component of 
A because it's screened by the finite density of fermions. So for this transverse spatial component, the in quantum gauge, the, the propagator looks like this. Uh, so this part is basically from this uh, seemingly Maxwell, this Maxwell like term, and this part is coming from the Nanda damping. Uh, this expression will be used for later. Okay, and this is what I think will be used later uh, for as um, this is the information which I think will be used for later for for the surface coupler to you engage field. Uh, let's pause for 30 seconds. Hey, Liu Jin. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So um, for the Landau damping of the gauge field, so this is just obtained by integrating out the fermions on the patch. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's like a RP approximation, I assume. Yeah. And uh, how do I justify this? Like the, this is, how do I control this? Yeah. Uh, you, for example, you can ask this paper is controlled by some combined expansion of uh, of uh, having many flavors of the fermions and having a small small value of epsilon. Okay, so you need both to control this. Uh, Strictly speaking, you need both. Okay, and you assume also a large number of flavors. So this is for controlling it. Uh, right. I guess I'm not really caring that much about controlling it at this stage. Okay. But if you really want to control it, you, uh, strictly speaking, you need a large number of flavors. All right, thank you. Sure. Any more questions? 30 seconds is gone. Okay, let's continue. So, so much for the uh, FA sector, that is a firm surface coupled to emergent U1 gauge field. Now let's look at the B sector. This is what we will tune to draft the transition. So in particular, I will tune uh, this B sector to go across a transition between superfluid and quantum hall, uh, quantum hall state. Um, yeah, let's see how it goes. So this is the superfluid quantum hall transition for the bosonic sector. In the, now because we decouple, we ignore the coupling between them. So A here is viewed as a prop gauge field. And the Lagrangian of this transition is written in this way. Uh, it, it may be a bit overwhelming, but I will explain where this Lagrangian comes from in the next slide. Here, let me just explain the location. Alpha here is another emergent U1 gauge field. And uh, this alpha, the alpha form is the transamons, uh, is a shorthand of the transamons. Uh, uh, Poseidon is uh, some emergent direct fermion, and here we have C plus one flavors of them. Remember, C is related to the density of electrons I introduced before. And in this theory, uh, you may wonder we have uh, we started with the theory of B. Now, where does B go? It doesn't appear in this theory, it seems. So it turns out B in this theory is the molecule of R. This theory, I think, was first uh, discussed in this paper and more extensively in this paper. So let's understand uh, why this theory can describe a quantum superfluid quantum hole transition. So let's look at the positive M side. Um, then we integrate out the fermions. You will see the transamus terms for alpha will cancel. Uh, and then using the Pascal that's called the Hopkin duality, we know this max 2 plus 1D Maxwell theory is just a superfluid. And this holds for any C. Uh, in the other side, if we integrate all the fermions, we will get the following effective action, which describes a quantum hole state. Okay. Uh, now let me explain where this theory comes from. Uh, there are two ways to interpret this theory. You can either, you can either use the more standard flux attachment um, picture. Uh, so then the first line is attaching a flux uh, to B and uh, convert B into a fermion Psi. Then the fermion Psi sees uh, flux of such a density. And then the second line describes the transition of Psi uh, 
between uh, between two chain insulators where one of the two has a chain number minus one, the other has a chain number C. Or you can understand it in the following way, you do another pattern construction where B is written as chi times psi, both chi and psi are fermions. And in this process, you introduce another U1 gauge field alpha, the effect of the sphere theory looks like this. Then the first line describes a state of chi that has a chain number one, a linear chain insulator of chi with chain number one. The second line describes the transition of psi uh, between two chain insulators with chain number minus one C. Okay, this is how you can understand this uh, theory. Let me make some remarks of this theory. You notice there's an emergent SUC plus one symmetry of this theory where psi transforms uh, in the fundamental representation. And then you can derive that the monopole P, the monopole of alpha, which is P, the original boson, is a singlet on the SUC plus one. And then there's an important, trans uh, important observation from this paper that is the translation symmetry will more precise the magnetic translation symmetry for these many perturbations, including uh, the mass term of the fermions that transforms in the adjoint representation and also the SUC plus one current operators and so on. So this allows the, theory, the transition to be accessible by tuning one parameter m, the uniform mass of the fermions. Uh, also for the dynamics we know for this theory, this direct transcendence theory, uh, if C is, if the number of flavor of fermions is large, it can, in the IR, it flows to a weakly coupled conformal field theory. Uh, you don't need to know too much about this conformal field theory. And what we need to know for the moment is that all operators that are neutral on the AL now in this theory have, have a scaling dimension that's larger than two, something around two. Uh, so the lowest non-trivial uh, neutral operator on the A has a skin dimension of two plus some one of C correction. As, so that, that's what I meant by, as long as C is large enough, those operators have skin dimension larger than two each. And there are many references for this. Uh, you also notice so far, I have not talked about the effect of the knowledge interaction. So let's talk about it. Uh, so we have this density interaction that decays in this power law form. Uh, notice uh, in this theory, the BL is the monopole of alpha or anti-monopole of alpha. What this tells us is now the charge fluctuation of the system corresponds to the flux fluctuation of alpha. Then we just uh, replace the uh, density, charge density fluctuation with flux fluctuation in this expression and uh, do a Fourier transform Fourier transformation to go to momentum space, we will see this known edge interaction now contributes to the effective action as a term of the uh, effective action of the, as a term of the interaction of the gauge field alpha. So in momentum space, it, is, it takes the following form. We have alpha squared with, uh, with uh, k to the one plus epsilon known edge in front. So what this is telling us is this known edge interaction is irrelevant compared to the transcendence term as long as x non range is larger than zero. Furthermore, in our theory, there will also inevitably be a local Maxwell interaction. And this non range interaction is more relevant uh, if epsilon non range is smaller than one and is uh, irrelevant compared to the Maxwell term if epsilon non range is larger than one. So in the case where epsilon non range is larger or uh, is, is greater or equal to one, then we can just consider Maxwell term. But we, now in this work with the range of epsilon non range we consider is larger than zero, but smaller than one. So uh, it's irrelevant compared to the transcendence term and more relevant compared to the Maxwell term. Okay, so these are the two sectors. And now let's combine the two sectors. So uh, let's first look at what, this, what the two phases become when we combine the two sectors. So for the bosonic sector, we have the superfluid quantum hole transition. Now, if we combine the two sectors, it turns out we will have a perpendicular to generalize the composite perpendicular transition. Uh, and the reason is the following. Uh, so the superfluid of uh, boson is just like in center transition. When we have a superfluid, the U1 gauge field A is fixed out and uh, the Fermi surface of F now implies the Fermi surface of C. So we have a 
from the liquid of the electrons C. Uh, in the quantum Hall side, to understand the physics, we can integrate out the gap the B and obtain the following effective theory for the fermions and gauge field. You will notice if this mu is equal to one half, this is precisely the effective action for the standard half and rate composite from liquid. But if mu is not one half, that's what we call the generalized composite from liquid. Let's say a little bit more about the generalized composite from liquid. Oh, so, can I ask a question about the previous slide? Uh, uh, I'm just a little bit puzzled by this Fermi liquid phase. So I presume you have a periodic potential here. Yeah. Uh, do you, don't you have to also worry about the half status spectrum or whatever? I mean, you've got many bands and it does, does any of that come in? Yeah, so that's why I fixed the flux density to be precisely one flux quantum per unit cell. Oh, okay. Okay. Right, thank you. Yeah, actually this, uh, this, uh, this is a, I think this is an important result from the paper um, of uh, Yin Chen, Chong, Ashwin, Max Alkel, and uh, Zhengyang Li, uh, the paper I cited before. So you need some special conditions for the flux and you need to fix the flux density and the particle density to be some special values. Okay, so this generalized the composite of liquid, uh, usually the composite of liquid is understood in terms of the flux attachment picture. But here it is not easy to understand this state in terms of flux attachment. Uh, so it's better to understand the state in terms of what we call flux removal, which I think is really the essence of flux attachment. So what we do is to remove the flux that the electron, electron C to remove it to the bosons so the electrons see no more flux and can form a Fermi surface. Uh, and, the, and doing flux attachment is just one way to do flux removal. Then if you look at the properties, properties of this generalized composite Fermi liquid, you, you can see it has similar thermodynamic and transport properties as the usual composite Fermi liquid, such as it's compressible, metallic, and so on. And this is obtainable from the usual LB locking analysis. But one notable difference between the generalized composite from liquid and the Hopkins rate composite from liquid is the spectral property. So in the Hopkins rate composite from liquid, the single electrons are supposed to be gapless, or in the lit in the literature, it's sometimes to start to have a have a soft gap. Here, the single electrons have a hard gap, so it's gapped by the bond state of C electrons have a soft gap, or you say it's gapless. One way to understand it is to look at this effective action where the density is chosen carefully. Uh, you will see if, if I want to create C electrons, uh, if I want to create one electron, then the only way I can do it is to have one F and one B. F is gapless, but B is gapped. So one electron is gapped. But if I want to have C electrons, instead of have C, Fs, and the C of Bs, I can also have C, F, and C plus one molecules of A. Uh, then you can see uh, this thing is gapless. So this phenomenon is kind of similar to orthogonal metal, which has similar thermodynamic and transport properties as the usual from liquid, but has different uh, spectral property. Or you can say the analogy between an orthogonal metal and a from liquid is analogous to the analogy between a generalized composite of liquid and composite of liquid. Okay, now let's look at the transition. Uh, uh, so um, now when, when we look at the transition, it's important to look at uh, the critical dynamics at the transition. Uh, and uh, I mentioned previously, uh, one way to use Cynthia's picture to look at the critical dynamics is sometimes we, we may have some kind of decoupling. In fact, this is a one-way decoupling described as follows. The statement is the following. Um, it's all described in this beautiful paper. So if we have, suppose in the B sector, all the gauge environment operators, gauge environment on, all, by all the gauge environment operators, I mean gauge environment operators on the A, if all these gauge environment operators have scaling dimension larger than three over two, then the criticality of B, of B sector is unaffected by the presence of the gapless FA sector, but the dynamics of the FA sector is greatly affected by the criticality of the B sector. Uh, when, I, when I was a graduate student and I 
perhaps someone you know, think I could understand this mechanism. So he explained to me that this relation is like an advisor and a student. So the advisor is barely affected by the student and the student is greatly affected by the advisor. This may, I think this is a really nice way to remember this relation. Um, let's try to understand it. So let's see uh, the effect of, of F A sector on B. Uh, so um, so it's, it's the effect from F A to B. So uh, to, to see it, then let's recall the form of the gauge field propagator here. Um, and let's see uh, from the perspective of the B sector, what it looks like. So from, in the B sector, the critical regime is where omega scales as K. And then look at here, when omega scales as K, this scales as a constant. So this form of the propagator is the same as a gapped, as something gapped. So that's it. that is to say, A now looks gapped to B. That's why A is irrelevant to the criticality of B. We can also look at the effect of F to B, and they are coupled by such operators, where OB is some gauge invariant operator under this A, and F that F represents some particle continuums coming from the Fermi surface. And to understand its effect, we can integrate out F, and what we will obtain is a, is a contribution to the effect of action of the boson in this form. So we have OB squared times a function that, that comes from integrating the fermions. This function is known. You don't need to worry about what it looks like. All you need to do is in the, we need to know is in the critical regime where omega scales as k, this function scales as a constant. Then what this implies is uh, this, uh, this coupling is also irrelevant if the scaling dimension of B is larger than uh, three halves. But this condition is satisfied for large C as we mentioned before. Uh, for large C, the bosonic theory flows to some weakly coupled CFP where all the gate event operators have scaling dimensions larger than something close to two. So it's not, when C is large enough, it's larger than three halves. Now, okay, so this is to say the FA sector has basically no effect on the B sector. Now let's look at the effect of the B sector to the FA sector. And to, to, to do so, let's integrate out the B uh, and the most important effect is to generate such a term for the effective action of the gauge field. Uh, you will see, you will see uh, it generates such a term. Uh, this is actually a universal form of the uh, result of uh, integrating out B for a CFT. Uh, so this sigma B is a, is a universal constant determined by the underlying CFT that describes the B transition. Uh, this is the action. If you look at the Lagrangian, uh, you just remove the integral sign, it looks like this. You will see um, this gauge field now is forced to have the epsilon parameter to be zero. Previously, epsilon is this k to the one plus epsilon. Now epsilon is zero, you have the critical point. So uh, now we are changing at the critical point, we are changing the value of epsilon. And we remember before uh, with a, with a with the uh, larger epsilon, we have stronger gauge fluctuations. So uh, here you see which, when we change epsilon to zero, the dynamics of the FA sector is modified. Okay, so let's summarize it here. What, uh, we, what we have here is the FA sector is, is, is this Fermi. So, so for a single layer, we have this transition between a Fermi liquid and a generalized composite Fermi liquid where the FA sector is a Fermi surface coupled to emergent UR gauge field and leads to a critical Fermi surface with no cross particles of F. And the B sector is described by the structure and sample theory. And notice the case where C is equal to one is discussed in this paper. Okay, um, after understanding the uh, single layer physics it's actually relatively simple to understand the bilayer physics. Let me quickly preview it here. Uh, so uh, now, suppose we have two layers of the single layer physics, we have two layers. Uh, then our strategy is to start from two decoupler layers and analyze the effect of the interlayer couplings. In the Fermi liquid side, when we couple them together, uh, we just get a larger Fermi liquid. 
And in the composite family, generalize the composite family to the side. Uh, it turns out I will, I will argue if we have two layers of generalized composite form liquid, they will be unstable to form an insulator. And this phenomenon, you can call, you, you, you may recognize this phenomenon is very familiar to what we learned in elementary school that one plus one is equal to zero. And at the transition, it turns out interlayer couplings can be irrelevant. Uh, so the special thing at the transition is there's a critical boson at the transition. So at the transition is one plus one times one, and uh, as we learned in elementary school, one plus one times one is equal to two. So we have two effectively decoupled transitions. Uh, let's understand it in more details. Uh, this is the, uh, let's first try to understand the case where the both bosons are gapped and in the quantum hole side. Uh, so we have the Fermi surface coupled to one gauge field and we have this picture before. Remember AC, suppress is pairing, wants to suppress pairing and the AS wants to enhance pairing. Um, so if we look at the effect of Lagrangian of the system, it looks like this is very similar to before, except now we have two layers with the layer index and uh, the two layers of fermions are coupled to AC plus AS and AC minus AS respectively. And now because of the quantum hole physics, uh, the density fluctuation of uh, the system is linked to the flux fluctuation of A, then the non energy interaction, now you plug it in and do your Fourier transformation, you will see the non energy interaction now contributes a term uh, of, of this form. Mm, so the feature is for AC, uh, it has a epsilon C that is, that is equal to epsilon non range, but for AS, uh, for AS uh, is just the usual Maxwell term. Uh, one way to understand this physically is because AC couples to the total density, but AS couples to the density difference. The density difference is like the, is like the dipole moment. So AC is really coupled to the dipole moment. It actually decays so fast that is irrelevant compared to the local max water. That's why for AS, we only have the local max water. So for, a, for AC, we have epsilon C equal to epsilon long range. For AS, we have epsilon S equal to one. Uh, as we said before, uh, with a larger epsilon, we have stronger gauge fluctuations. Now epsilon S is larger than epsilon C, so AS is more important than AC. And that is to say, because eventually AS wants to enhance pairing, that is to say we will have interlayer pairing of the two layers and then get an insulator. We can also understand this more formally by looking at the flow equations of these quantities. Uh, and they are written here. Mm, and you see, uh, so basically what you need to do compared to a single layer case is to replace the epsilon by the appropriate values of epsilon. And also for uh, the pairing flow, it has this kind of form. And from the first two equations, you can see as long as epsilon C is smaller than epsilon S, the fixed, attractive fixed point of value of the gauge couplings is such that alpha C is zero, but alpha S is one half. Then you combine with the last one, you will see a V flows to negative infinity and that signals uh, interlayer pairing. So this is uh, why one plus one is equal to zero. If we have two layers of generalized composite film liquids, we get an insulator. I haven't described what the nature of the insulator is. Uh, you can see a detailed description in the paper and actually I think that description is quite interesting. Okay. Uh, after understanding why one plus one is equal to zero, let's understand why one plus one times one is equal to two at critical point. Since, and you, ah, yeah. since you mentioned the property of insulator, can you just describe by words? Oh, uh, so it depends on uh, a couple of factors. First, uh, a couple of first uh, there's uh, this uh, value of C that I mentioned before that controls the density of the system. It also controls the number of flavors of drug fermions. So um, generically, the insulator has a topological order and uh, precisely which topological order describes it depends on C. Also, it also uh, this topological order also depends on uh, the pairing channel, the, eventually the fermions want to pair. This pairing channel is kind of non universal it can be anything. So after, after knowing the value of C and knowing the pairing channel, you can derive the topological order. But in the derivation, you, 
sometimes have to be more careful because uh, eventually you will have a lot of transcendent terms and some of the transcendent terms are coupled to fermions or you may want to refer it as a spin C connection. So if you want to use it, use the standard k matrix formalism, you have to somehow convert the spin C connection into the usual you want to here. And we did this carefully in the paper. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, can I make sure? So can I say the insulator can be trivially gap, maybe my insulator, or it can be also topological order, or it could be also maybe SPT or something else? Generically, it's a topological order because uh, we have a density that is uh, uh, not uh, integer. Uh, in one case, in one case of the value of C and uh, the pairing channel is, uh, is the exciton condensate. So it's just a gapless space, um, a short energy entangled gapless space, but generically it just has a topological order. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So let's see what's special at the critical point. Uh, at the critical point, um, let's, let's integrate out B. As we said before, uh, we will have uh, this kind of form. Previously, we only look at the one layers. Now we add the two layers together and we decompose the gauge field into AC and AS. We will see and this can be written in this way. And uh, what this implies is, first of all, uh, from this form, you can see at the critical point, epsilon C and epsilon S are both zero. Uh, second, uh, you will see the when we integrate out the bosons, the gauge couplings are the same. So this should be viewed as the UV bare value of the gauge couplings and using which we should study the RG flow. And the RG flow equations are written here. So epsilon C and epsilon S are zero. So the first term uh, is gone. And we have the second term. Uh, now you see, um, but if you, in case you don't remember, alpha c is basically ec squared, alpha s is es squared. Uh, so you, now you see in the pairing um, flow equation, I added one more term here. Previously, I never added this term. Um, that's because previously this, uh, the first term is non-zero and it is more, is more, the second term is subdominant compared to the first term. Uh, that's why I didn't add it. I didn't add it. Now um, you see alpha c is equal to alpha s. Uh, and in fact, from these two beta functions, you can see the ratio of uh, these two gauge couplings is RG invariant. So on the RG, uh, this value is always zero. Uh, and to analyze the effect of gauge fluctuations on pairing, it's important to add this second term. So we add it here. And the conclusion is here, the firm surface can be stable as long as the UV value of V is positive. Uh, let me mention one curious feature of uh, this theory here. Uh, from these two beta functions, you can see the ratio of these two gauge couplings is RG invariant, but these two beta functions are only obtained at the leading order. So these two beta functions are predictive. However, uh, interestingly, in fact, the ratio of the gauge coupling alpha C over alpha S is actually RG invariant as a non-predictive statement. This is due to the non-analytical nature of uh, this kinetic term of gauge field. Um, you can find more detailed argument in this paper. Uh, furthermore, uh, using the methods from this paper, you can also analyze the effect of other interlayer couplings, including interlayer electron tunnels at the transition. You will see they're also irrelevant. So what we conclude here is if we have two, um, general, two layers of Fermi liquid, two generalized composite Fermi liquid, we can obtain a transition from a Fermi liquid to an insulator. Where this insulator is a result of the instability of two layers of generalized composite Fermi liquid. And the transition, this deconfined mechanical ins metal insulator transition can be viewed as two effectively decoupled um, single layer transitions. So in this picture, you see in the Fermi liquid side, as we approach the critical point, uh, the quasi particle residue of the electrons approaches zero. And at the critical point, the gap of the bosonic pattern starts to grow. Uh, so uh, physically, um, in this side, above the scale of the bosonic pattern, the RG flow is described by these equations. So everything want to, wants to flow to zero. 
but this flow is cut off by the scale of the boson gap. And below this boson gap, the RG flow is described by the beta functions from the previous page, where, which tells us when the system wants to develop a pairing gap for the fermions. And this is the pairing gap. Okay, so uh, this is the transition. Uh, and we can also um, talk about the observable signatures. For example, there will be a singular specific heat. Uh, there will be a jump of resistivity. Maybe what's mo most exotic is there will be some degenerate power law decaying charge density wave correlations uh, with the same power law exponent. Uh, you can find more details in these papers. Mm, let me make some remarks. So I focused on the case where, where epsilon long range is larger than zero but smaller than one. I mentioned the case of epsilon equal to zero is the same as Coulomb interaction. So this Coulomb interaction turns out to be two level marginal at the transition. So to analyze its effect, we have to consider loop corrections, uh, which is ongoing. Uh, we can also um, talk, talk about the case where epsilon long range is equal or greater than one. In this case, uh, yes, uh, equal or less relevant than the local maximal interactions. So we can, in this case, we can just consider short range interactions and uh, put epsilon c as the same as epsilon s uh, to be one if the if bosons are in the quantum hole set. Then um, in this case, uh, this interaction is non energy interaction is still irrelevant at the transition. But one thing I'm not entirely sure is whether we will have an insulator at all in the uh, in the quantum hole side of the boson. That is, if now we look at the flow equations and plug epsilon c and epsilon s to be one here, it looks like this. Uh, so the feature here is from the first two equations, you will see the ratio of alpha c over alpha s is arch invariant. But let me emphasize, in this case, this is just a perturbative statement. Mm. Under high, with higher order corrections taken into account, I'm not sure if this is true. And so because this ratio is arch invariant, so the flows of uh, alpha c and alpha s are described by these straight lines, and they flow to a fixed line shown here, the red line. And then if we combine this fixed line with the last equation, um, part, uh, part of the segment is stable against the pairing, and the other part is unstable. So uh, in this case, it's, in, it's important to examine the effect of higher order effects, higher order corrections to these beta functions. And there are some scenarios. For example, maybe the fixed line still survives on the higher order, but it may be deformed. And still some part is stable, some part is unstable. Or maybe the fixed line is, is collapsed into a couple of fixed points, or the fixed line may just disappear altogether. And so if the uh, so if the uh, b and the case b and case c happens, we need to use these cases to analyze the pairing instability instead of using the fixed line. Uh, and I want to mention there's a recent work that claims the fixed line survives up to two loops, but it's important to go to if it survives, we need we cannot stop. Okay, let me summarize here. Uh, so I introduced the notion of deconfined mechanical quantum criticality as a continuous quantum phase transition be associated with an abrupt change of a generic electronic frame surface uh, compared to the previously studied case. I don't want any remaining neutral frame surfaces in the phases. And uh, I um, presented an uh, idea of of the mechanism to achieve such a transition, that is to use this kind of color superconductivity type mechanism. Uh, and I, there's a, I've also presented an example of such a transition in the context of quantum hole bilayers. Mm, there's some outlook, for example, in the example, uh, it's interesting to look at the case where x non energy is zero or greater and larger than one. Uh, and it is also interesting to work out more observable consequences of these transitions. And also now we have this mechanism, we can just construct more theories in this family and find more applications. Uh, maybe conceptually and theoretically, it's important to uh, develop what I like to refer as the ultimate understanding of these transitions 
namely an intrinsic understanding of the universal physics of these transitions without referring to any Lagrangian Hamiltonian wave function, is kind of uh, disappointing that this theory is still formulated by the ancient ideas of partners coupled to gauge fields. But now, nowadays, we have more and more examples of this kind of ultimate understanding. So it would be nice to have such an understanding. OK, uh, these are what I want to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. for a wonderful lecture based on how the talk. Any questions from the audience? Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, so can you go back to the slide where you have this alpha S and alpha C? Which slide? Uh, just next one, I think. Next one? Yeah, this one. Uh -huh. If you can tune alpha S and alpha C as a parameter, could you also get this metal insulator transition? I mean, just tune mm -hmm. along the line of the... Oh, just the tune alpha C and alpha S, right? So uh, suppose yes. the fixed line survives. Uh, yeah, suppose that survives. Suppose the fixed line survives, you are saying if I tune along this direction, then we will yeah, have a yeah. relation between two insulators where one of them has a neutral from the surface and the other does not. Oh, oh. I see, I see. Okay. I see. Can I ask something? Sure. Um, I probably know the answer, but let me just confirm. So if you look in the metallic side of your transition, um, you know, where the gauge fields are both capped because of the Higgs condensation. Uh, so in principle, you will have some uh, you know, short range but attractive interaction in the same channel that uh, on the uh, composite from a liquid side, you have a long range pairing interaction, right? But, uh, you know, this competes against the repulsive pairing interaction coming from the charge channel. So have you looked at uh, whether the metallic side has a net pairing instability or not? No, it doesn't. Uh, uh, so it took me a while to understand what you were asking. Um, I, I think I understand what you're asking. So you're asking, uh, suppose I can have this transition in the metallic set immediately going into the metallic set. Should I really get a liquid or a superconductor, something like that? Yeah. So uh, if you look at these beta functions, you, in the metallic set, it's still about the scale of uh, the uh, strength of the boson condensation or stiffness, and the RG flow is described by these equations. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, right, in, right across the transition, um, the stiffness is very small. So um, for, for a known RG time, everything, the flow is controlled by these RG equations. And you will see uh, these things. For first, the V first wants to flow to a positive number and then flow to zero. So close enough to uh, that transition in the liquid side, V is positive and a bit, um, above the scale of the stiffness and going down below the stiffness is just a, the flow is described by the formula form and, and it starts with a bare value that's positive. So if we ignore current Nottinger, then it's a stable metal. Okay, yeah, no, I thought that's what you might say. Uh, similar thing happens at the mod transition as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, I'm going for this from that example. Yeah, so all right, very good, thanks. Thank you. So, Jin, did you mention the insulator side also can have a ghost on Oh. 
uh, in one case, so I said the nature of the insulator depends on the, on the value of C and that controls what quantum host state the bosons are in. And it, it also depends on the pairing channel of the fermions. In one case of C and the pairing channel, it has a Goldstone mode. If I assume uh, the two layers have individual E1 charge conservation symmetry, uh, that Goldstone mode corresponds to uh, the breaking of, uh, of uh, breaking of the E1 symmetry generated by the charge difference of the two layers. That's the exception condensate phase. And it's a nature of the transition still the same if the insulator side has goes on modes. You know, uh, the nature of this transition determine, is determined by the, the integer C. Uh, so if I change C, it's a different nature. Well, but uh, one can qualify this question by saying I fix C, but I change the value of uh, uh, I change the pairing channel of the fermion, then for this fixed C, there's only a single pairing channel where we have constant mode. Uh, so you can ask if I fix the C, but change the um, pairing channel uh, where I get different transitions, then my answer is at the transition, you get the same transition, but in the phase, you get different phases. So which um, pairing channel you have uh, is determined not by the Mm, not by the universal physics of the transition, but by uh, something else, uh, precisely, more precisely by the pairing instability. Um, so this pairing is uh, dangerously irrelevant. Mm. So to analyze which, uh, which, one, which pairing channel will really occur, uh, it's not really determined by the critical point. Thanks. Any more questions or comments? In any case, let's thanks, uh, Liu Jun. Very much thank you, Liu for the. Wonderful lecture. Thank you. Okay. okay, thanks, Jovan.